If all the guests have come in, just please close the door. Thank you. Good morning and welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here on this cloudy and rainy Bangalore morning. It means a lot to us that you've come here to celebrate with us the opening of the Infosys Science Foundation offices here in Bangalore. So we've had, uh, the Science Foundation has been in existence since 2009, but uh, this is the inauguration of our first ever home, and we hope that we do many, many good things here with all of you. Thank you for coming. May I request you all to please turn, turn off your cell phones if they're on? Thank you. We're very pleased with us to have with us here all the trustees of the Infosys Science Foundation, without whom this would not have been possible. So we have with us here the president of the foundation, Chris Gopalakrishnan, Nandan Nilekani, Mohandas Pai, S.T. Shibulal, and our founder and trustee, Mr. Uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Kedinesh, Srinath Patni, I mentioned, and our founder and uh, the founder of Infosys and our trustee, Narayan Murthy, will not be able to join us physically, but he is on Zoom as is fitting in a post-COVID world. And without further ado, I would like to welcome on stage Mr. Chris Gopalakrishnan, co-founder of Infosys and the Science Foundation, philanthropist, science evangelist, and of course, our president, to officially welcome you all. Chris. Thank you, Bhavana. And uh, let me also add my welcome to all of you. Um, the, the people standing, maybe if the, you can also all sit down. Um, so let me add my welcome to all of you. Um, you know, it's uh, uh, our pleasure to host you today. And I hope uh, this will become one of many uh, such uh, events uh, here. As Bhavana said, uh, this is um, the home of uh, Infosys Science Foundation. But more importantly, uh, I believe that this will become home as a collaboration space, as a meeting place in South Bangalore for many such public uh, events in science, art, um, engineering. You know, when people think about um, uh, either a, a uh, seminar, uh, a workshop, um, this could become an address, and that's. Um, really uh, the reason. Of course, the Science Foundation Secretariat uh, will have offices here. Uh, they will be working out of this building. Uh, we will have uh, lectures by um, famous personalities in science, arts, etc. Our laureates will uh, come to this uh, building again for public lectures. We'll bring uh, school students to talk to them about uh, um, science, a career in science, etc., and and you know this is part of um, our vision to uh, look at Bangalore as a um, a very large collaboration uh, space. Um, this is probably the only city in the world, and I'm very deliberately using the word in the world, where you have. Um, uh, deep roots in science, research, etc., engineering. Uh, you have National Law School, you have I am Bangalore, um, you have other um, um, liberal arts uh, colleges, um, you have um, uh, the IT uh, services and IT industry based here in Bangalore, uh, significant presence. Uh, you have the startup. Um, companies based here, venture capital is based here, and you have the R&D labs of um, uh, Indian and uh, global multinationals based here. Uh, I don't think uh, anywhere in the world um, such a congregation of um, science, engineering, and research, um, and arts uh, is, is there, congregation is there, and we are not really taking advantage of that. Very rarely do we 
get together. Uh, you know, I, I, I know that uh, Professor Vijay Raghavan is here in the audience. Um, he was there. Ah, yeah, he's there. So um, he initiated when he was the principal scientific advisor a um, Bangalore cluster program, but it seems to be you know slowed down or kind of um, put on back burner. I think we need to, but I think it has to be taken over by the public, and the public must uh, enable this to happen. And hopefully, Infosys Science Foundation will play a role in this because to take full advantage of Bangalore's. Uh, capability, I think we need to um, look at us all working together and, uh, uh, and, and collaborating on the future of not just Bangalore, Karnataka, but future of India. Uh, as we look forward for the you know, next, let's say 25 years or um, you know, 100 years from uh, independence, uh, clearly, um, creation of knowledge, application of knowledge will become very important. Uh, our startups will uh, need to look at um, uh, deep technology as one of the drivers for uh, new business creation. Uh, we need to uh, bring research from lab to market. We need to think about uh, uh, social issues and uh, new models for development. All of this requires uh, us to collaborate and work together, uh, and and not just for again India, but all the also the world um, in making this happen. Um, I also feel that we need to invest more money in research. Uh, some of you may have uh, heard me speak about this uh, from 0.7 percent of GDP to about 3 percent of GDP. Of this, uh, the private contribution must be at least 1.5% from 0.1% today, 15 times what we are investing. And it also includes, of course, philanthropy, CSR, and industry supporting research. All of these things are required for us to create a truly a knowledge society. And that is where I think the future is, and Bangalore can play. I don't think there's any city in India which can play a role in making this happen. To me, that is uh, what this uh, day is all about. That's what uh, we want to get the message out. You know, we need physical spaces, in, even though you know, we talk about online spaces, we need physical spaces where we can meet. Uh, you know that um, BIC uh, is a physical space uh, in Indranagar. Science Gallery Bangalore uh, is coming up in the city. So that'll be another uh, physical space. Ranga Shankara, uh, is another uh, uh, physical space. This will be yet another one. And we should open up uh, you know, our uh, uh, academic institutions as places for collaboration, et cetera. Um, and and uh, I think that's what Vijay Raghavan really wanted. And, and hopefully, we can all work together to make it happen. Uh, you know, this is the opening of the building, inauguration of the building. And so, uh, you know, it, it requires uh, effort from many people, um, starting with, uh, uh, you know, the, the board, the, the management of Infosys for supporting Infosys Science Foundation, uh, the, you know, the vision for this building with uh, Murthy, Narayan Murthy giving um, you know, shape to that. Uh, the infrastructure team at Infosys who have helped uh, project manage this. Uh, and, um, and, and, and we have a, a very dedicated uh, secretariat led by Bhavana. Uh, I think, uh, I don't know, last three years effort in uh, making this happen into a reality. So. Um, though this is a welcome speech, I think I should uh, say thank you to all of the people to, to make this indeed happen. Such a beautiful space, beautiful building, and uh, hope uh, we get uh, many more occasions to host you, uh, not just you, but uh, many other people also. And this becomes integral part of the vision for Bangalore to become a truly a international knowledge city. Thank you very much.
Thank you for laying out that vision so beautifully, Chris. Uh, and uh, as general manager of the foundation since inception, I've had the pleasure of hearing this vision articulated by our various trustees, but I would like to share it with all of you through a brief AV presentation. See, one of the, the theories propounded by psychologists is that youngsters are inspired by role models. So one of the instruments we have is to recognize role models, honor them in front of a large number of youngsters. Is propounded by psychologists is that youngsters are inspired by role models. So one of the instruments we have is to recognize role models, honor them in front of a large number of youngsters. I do believe that this is very important for India. See, if you look at the success of the US environment in the work of success, a very strong connection between the industry and the academia. Academia has to be very successful for that industry then can depend on academia for its future. The country can only advance with long-term research because ultimately that fundamental research leads to applied research that leads to problem solving. The only thing that we have to do is develop some research from many, many years back in some field or the other. Those key thoughts, the key to this entire thing that we need to do in this study is about fighting them, fighting and inspire them, and showcase them to the world that they are of global standard and they can discover and solve the problems of India, which can be applied to the world also. And by that in mind, you know, we set up this infosys transformation to reward and recognize the great scientists. These are all truly uh, extraordinary people, gifted people, people who did extraordinary pieces of work. So they are uh, inspirational for me. What gives me hope is you look at infosys by the winners of this have already gone on to win something. People are not in number five and number five. Now that gives me hope. Simple pride. That's probably one of the first to recognize this person. I think that is what I'm happy on this side. <coughs> so I am proud of what they have accomplished. I would like to see two things happen with Infosys Pride over the next 10 years. First and foremost, it becomes the largest prize about research in India. It becomes uh, recognized around the world. <coughs> Second, I would like to see the laureates becoming icons for research about India, driving transformation of our society, driving economic growth, job creation, and uh, wealth creation. Let the youngsters in the country understand that in this country, we will honor scientists, we will honor researchers, we will salute them, we will cheer them. And with that, it is only fitting that I invite to join us Mr. Narayana Murthy, the founder of Infosys and uh, also the Infosys Science Foundation, um, to tell us a little bit about the spiritual entity of the Science Foundation as well as the brick and mortar entity and tell us about its purpose. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Murthy. Thank you for joining us. 
Thank you, Bhavna. I am not able to be present in person due to an ear injury. Friends, welcome to this new home of the Infosys Science Foundation. Infosys Science Foundation has just entered its teens. The trustees felt that ISF must have a modern, comfortable, technology enabled and productive home in the city with an easy connection to the public transport system so that the students and teachers interested in science and science research can congregate here and participate in science related events. This building has offices for ISF professionals, several conference rooms, a hundred seater technology enabled auditorium and a large place for lunches and dinners. We felt that such a home was necessary for ISF to scale up its operations and to strengthen its identity. ISF is grateful to Infosys for its financial support to this project. Winston Churchill once said, I quote him, we shape our buildings, thereafter they shape us. Obviously he was talking about the House of Commons. My fond hope is that this modern building will be a citadel of openness to new ideas, curiosity, critical thinking, healthy skepticism, and agreeable disagreement for our young minds, and that it will shape their minds to become good researchers. Why did we start Infosys Prize for Sciences? What is science after all? Science is about unraveling the mysteries of nature. It is about observing a natural phenomenon, studying its anomaly with the existing theories, and coming out with new ideas and theories that result in explanations for these anomalies. Let me just take two examples and explain them in a very simple way. It may not satisfy the rigor of scientists present here. Einstein observed the orbit of Mercury and found that it did not fit Newton's theory of motion. He thought about this problem deeply the result was his general theory of relativity. The accuracy of GPS and the working of PET scanners, among many other applications, are based on this wonderful theory. A second example, revolutionary ideas about atomic structure, and the concept of light as particles as against light as waves was propounded by several well-known thinkers, including Maxwell, Boltzmann, Max Planck, Broglie, and Albert Einstein. It led to Niels Bohr's explanation for the spectral lines of the hydrogen atom. 
these ideas of Niels Bohr and the work of Heisenberg, Pauli, and Schrodinger resulted in the birth of quantum mechanics. Today's lasers for eye surgery, integrated circuits that are so ubiquitous, DVDs and laser printers are just a few resultants from quantum mechanics. Engineering is about using such scientific ideas to create a world that never was. Telephone, television, motor cars, electricity, mobile phones, stethoscope, stents, and computers are all good examples of the result of engineering research. Observing real life around us also yields spectacular ideas to our engineers. Let me give you an example of a computer science idea that came from observing a day-to-day -day phenomenon. The Dutch computer science researcher, Edsger Dijkstra, wanted to find a solution to the problem of controlling access to shared resources for concurrent tasks in multi-threaded software systems. Folks, this was a big problem when I was a student in the late 60s. One day, he was relaxing on a bench at the local railway station in Holland, and he was watching trains go by. He observed how the railway signals operated and realized that those signals allowed only one train to be on a platform at a given time. The result was the design of the well-known P and V semaphores without which modern operating systems and shared resource systems in a multitasking environment just cannot work. Why is research in the six categories for emphasis price important to India? Our country is making scientific and engineering progress. We have sent rockets and satellites into space. We have built steel plants, power plants, and huge dams. We have produced COVID vaccines. We do heart and kidney transplants. However, we are still a long way off from solving our grand problems of education, healthcare, nutrition, and shelter for every one of our 1.4 billion Indians. As people interested in science, mathematics, and engineering, we must think about how these fields can solve our grand problems. I understand that such grand problems cannot be solved just by science, mathematics, and engineering alone. It requires a cultural transformation of the Indian mindset. That is where social sciences become extremely important. But that discussion is for another day. I do not know of any nation that has solved its problems of poverty, ill health, and nutrition and attained economic prosperity without using the power of human mind to solve its grand problems. Our science, mathematics, and engineering researchers are the country's frontline warriors in our war against our grand problems. That is why we must encourage them. 
a few winners of the Infosys Prize have gone in on to do useful work in their desire to solve some of these daunting problems. We at Infosys Science Foundation believe in the words of President Roosevelt that the true test of a country's progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much, but it is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. Our small contribution in this war against India's grand problems is to recognize these frontline research warriors, applaud them, honor them, and reward them. Folks, we are proud to be doing this year after year. I congratulate Infosys, Infosys Science Foundation, the trustees and the officers of ISF for their extraordinary work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Murthy. Thank you so much for um, elaborating on India's grand challenges and our contribution to it, our hopeful contribution to it. After hearing from the visionary founders of the ISF, we will now hear from a set of scholars at different stages of academic life in a session titled A Portrait of a Young Scientist, Aspirations and Challenges of Doing Research in India. So I would like to welcome on stage the first participant in this. We have four in all. And after, you know, after Venisha, the youngest participant speaks, she will hand over to the next person and so on. Let's hear from my youngest speaker now. Venisha Umashankar is an artist, a TEDx speaker, an innovator, a climate activist from Tiruvannamalai in Tamil Nadu. Her innovation, the solar ironing cart, made her the first and the, sorry, the youngest finalist of the Earthshot Prize uh, in 2021. She spoke along with Prince William, the Duke of Cambridge, at the UN Climate Conference, COP26, in Glasgow and at the World, and at the World Leaders' Summit. Venetia advocates change through innovation. Let's hear from her how she ideated and researched her innovation and took it from sketch to prototype to effect real life transformations for people and for climate. Over to you, Vinisha. Change. It's the only constant aspect of our ever-changing world. We face it every single day. But these changes, whether they seem good or not, will definitely teach you something new. But our planet seems to have a different plan in mind. It's the change of our climate, climate change. I'm Venisha Mashankar, a 15-year-old student, innovator, and public speaker, here to speak to you today on a few topics ranging from innovation to climate change. So let me start. When you think about the future, what do you envision? The most common answer 10 years ago was actually flying cars. And though we have accomplished it, it's actually not the most defining aspect of the 21st century. The 21st century is actually defined by rapid developments in technology and reaching new heights, literally. But there's also another aspect of the 21st century that most of us chose to ignore in the past. It's climate change and how exactly it harms our environment. So what have we done and what can we do to prevent this in the future, or at least reduce it? Abdul Kalam used to say that the greatest strength of our country right now is its youth, with over 800 million of us in the country. So what could we do as today's youth to help reduce the impact of climate change? Well, I've asked myself this question time and time again over the years since I was in middle school. And I would like to show you a problem right now that I chose to solve 
and has actually impacted our country way worse than any of you would think. I'm pretty sure all of you here would have seen such a charcoal-based iron box, but you would not give it a second thought if you saw it on the street. Why? Because it's so deep-rooted in our tradition and culture that we don't think about it too much. But if you actually do give it a second thought, you would realize that there are several problems with it. Though this has been around for several centuries, we are changing in a world where things are becoming more sustainable. And with that, charcoal-based ironing causes air pollution, deforestation, respiratory diseases, and most importantly, it contributes to climate change. And for several years, we do not understand this. I thought there was something wrong with the process and at 12 years old decided to come up with a solution for this problem, the solar powered ironing cart. With the solar ironing cart, it has a lifespan of 25 to 30 years and it is powered completely through solar energy, eliminates the usage of charcoal for ironing clothes, reduces air pollution, deforestation and the severity of climate change. It also fulfills 13 out of the 15 Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, excluding the 16th and 17th ones. And I've spoken on several stages across the world, but I would like to bring to you two important initiatives that I thought were interesting, apart from my own innovation. The first one is a solar-powered power bank by Flash Bay. And even though I'm here to speak today about the solar ironing cut, I thought it would be interesting to show you a few initiatives that have happened across the world that could also be implemented in India. One of them is this, and the other one is the climate ticket. In Austria, they have an initiative where at the start of the year, you can pay a thousand euros and use all public transport for the rest of the year which is really interesting because if you use public transport every day, then you would be spending over 5,000 euros in Austria. However, with the climate ticket, you can save so much with just 1,000 euros. I think such an initiative would also be very useful in India with such a high population and with many of us using public transport. So that's one initiative which I thought to bring. Finally, I'd just like to say that Though climate change is a big problem to solve, small acts, when multiplied by millions of people, can transform the world. So even the simple things you do today, which can impact the environment in a positive way, will make a difference when we all come together. Just remember, innovation can sometimes make the seemingly impossible possible. Thank you. Right now, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. She is an undergraduate at physics at the Azim Premji University, and she is about to start her master's at the University of Bonn in Germany. She is interested in particle physics, nonlinear dynamics, and the history and philosophy of science and physics. She aspires to do interdisciplinary research, integrating subjects outside of science into physics. So let's give it up for Arati Parameshwaran onto the stage. Thank you, Venisha. Um, so it is truly my honor to be speaking in front of you about my experience as a science student in India and what I aspire to see as I go through my career of research. Um, so I recently finished my undergraduate degree, so my exposure to research is limited to what I did there, mostly in my honors thesis. I worked on a classic fluid dynamics problem known as taylor Kuwait flow, and I looked at the problem both computationally and experimentally. And I was given the freedom to do whatever I wanted, which I think is important with research as it shouldn't be limited to just um, things that are given to you and things that have been done in the past. 
And I think doing this project gave me a real taste of what research is like. And it was truly fascinating to see things that I'd done on paper manifesting visually and the sense of satisfaction that you get from seeing your results being in accordance with theory is uh, something that's unparalleled. And um, since I was at a private university, budget was not a restriction and it was very flexible based on what I wanted to do. And having done such a research project this early really helped um, shape my uh, positive inclination towards doing research as a career. So challenge, some of the challenges I faced in India, so while India is a great place to do research and particularly science, given its longstanding history with the subject, there's still a lot of gaps that need to be filled in order to make it one of the forerunners in science. So one of the biggest challenges I see is the demographic ratios of people in the field. The number of researchers in India are uh, per million of the population is 253, while countries that are at the top, like the UK, Europe, and Japan, they average about 4,000 researchers per million of their population, which is a stark difference. And this is also further exacerbated along the lines of gender, caste, and class. The gender ratios are very skewed, and there's only minimal representation of people in the field that aren't male. And um, so the charts here describe this problem. And the table on the left shows the number of students enrolled across various levels in different institutions. And the graph on the right shows the distribution of the faculty in these uh, institutions. And you can see that there's clearly a very big difference between the number of male and female faculty members as well. And 43% of STEM graduates in India are women, but only 14% of them make it to the workforce. And this happens because of a lack of support and lack of proper policy that is oriented towards their needs. So this is sort of disheartening to see or uh, to not see people like me in the field, because it sort of, um, it doesn't exactly help us envision a future of establish successfully establishing a career here. And another issue is a problem with funding. As it was mentioned earlier, India spends only 0.7% of its GDP on R&D, and most of it goes into defense, while other countries spend as much as 3 to 5%. And this makes it difficult for researchers to gain, fund, gain funding effectively. And there's also a lot of red tape and bureaucracy involved, which really slows down the process. And this becomes a problem because research can be extremely time sensitive. And in order to be on par with its counterparts, counterparts in other countries, you need to do research fast. And over the course of my degree, another thing that was apparent is the competitiveness of being in this field and the dearth of opportunities that adds to this. It's very hard for students to find research projects or internships in labs without having proper connections in the field. And I was lucky enough to receive this opportunity at my university, but this isn't the case for everyone. And I think creating such opportunities of working at labs is vital at such an early stage. Only then can students get a real taste of research and see how rewarding it can be. And there's also not a lot of recognition and credit given where it's due to researchers, which undermines the work they do. And this inequity of gender is also reflected through these awards that are given, where you see that most recipients of these awards are uh, mostly male. And um, some reasons why students choose to go abroad, including me, is um, one, it's an easier and smoother admission process. If, if you want to study at a top institution in India, you need to go through a series of rigorous competitive exams. And these aren't necessarily a true marker in determining the true potential of a science student. And it also becomes easier to receive scholarships and stipends. And there's also no tuition fees in some countries. And there's also proximity to an abundance of research labs for instance, the Max Planck Research School in Germany. And they very often um, offer students work that is paid well. And this gives more incentive to actually do research. And there's also more scope for doing interdisciplinary studies, um, especially outside of sciences, which is one of the reasons I've chosen to study in Germany. Um, so, some, so my aspirations are obviously to see uh, how these problems can be resolved in the future. And I would love to contribute to helping resolving these issues. And this can be done by ensuring equity in terms of representation of people in STEM field along the lines of gender, caste, class. And this can be done through affirmative action and policy 
that helps them, uh, that is oriented towards their needs. And another important step would be to increase funding and opportunities for work and encourage students to do more research work by making the resources available to them. And awards, since awards that are given are also reflective of the gender representation, this should be taken into recognition while, uh, while recognizing the work, and this will encourage more participation. And another important part of this lies in having effective science communication. Science, as we know it, is extremely esoteric, even within different fields of science. And it is vital that the public engages with science in order to truly value it, which is why we need to be able to effectively convey what we learn in layman's terms to help uh, people understand what the, how much work is actually being put into uh, research. And this will actually give uh, researchers more recognition in the public's eyes. So yeah. Uh, so these are the things that I wish to see change in this country, and I'm glad that uh, organizations like the Infosys Science Foundation are helping contribute towards this goal. Thank you. Um, yeah. I would like to introduce the next speaker, and it is my pleasure to introduce Girija. Uh, Girija is a green person who resonates with nature and believes in a sustainable lifestyle. She is a research scholar at the Devecha Center for Climate Change at IISE, and her passion for agriculture led to the nexus of sanitation and food production. She loves working with the community, farmers, and talking to the general public. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ati, for that nice introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm very glad to be part of this event. Uh, before I start, let me first take, take you through this research work I'm doing, the work what I'm doing. I mean, first question, like, uh, do we ever think, well, what happens after we flush? That's the area we are working. I'm working on water and sanitation. So our toilets and pit latrines are all connected to the septic tanks, yeah? The waste, what happens after that? Once it is filled, it is all transported, and then it, what happens? Yeah, we have this thing of flushing and forgetting, right? So it is actually disposed, disposed to the environment, yeah, disposed to the water body. If we look at the delta, 90% of the wastewater generated in developed and developing countries and 70% in the in India is disposed to the environment. So to get the perspective of uh, risk potential, almost uh, one truckload disposed is equivalent to 5,000 people defecating openly. So there is the environmental risk, and hence there is public health risk. So we need to think beyond toilet. Yeah, no doubt we have made a remarkable progress and the Swachh Bharat mission, where uh, now we have 100% coverage of toilets and we have the safety transportation system and then the uh, this waste is treated in treatment systems. But what is left unaddressed is what do we do with the end product that comes out of this treatment system? Yeah, the mass is still there and we have not solved that problem. This is my focus area where I will be looking into bringing the nutrients that is present in human waste specifically back to the system, which is called the sustainable sanitation system. So why do you want to do that? Because there is resource constraint in agriculture sector. 50 per, four, more than 50% 50 of India is under water stress and uh, our soil is degraded. The quality is degraded because of more and more chemical applications and also our plants are deficient with nutrients. And we need to feed a huge number of population that is expected by 2050. So this is about my work. When it comes to challenges and aspirations as a researcher in India, what I feel as a women researcher in India, the representation of women in research, like Aarti was also mentioning, is very low. The number says that. Most probable reason for uh, would be that that women cannot afford to give that long term commitments, maybe because of all this uh, settling concepts that uh, we need to get married on time and have kids on time. I mean, nobody to blame, but yeah, <laughs> but uh, because we cannot delay the biological cycle, yes. And this is a very specific issue that women will only face, yeah. And then also the research like mine, which is field based, I need to visit uh, fields frequently. So there are many issues with the safety and access to safe toilets. I mean, forget about the safety, toilets itself, yeah? So those are the issues. So this will restrict the uh, choices of uh, women to take up the uh, career she wants to. 
And then uh, if you look at the global data, the, the representation of global south is very low when compared to the global north. I mean, this can be attributed to the opportunities they have, the enabling environment they have in the research landscape to conduct research. And the next thing, the most uh, important challenge is the access to fundings and facilities. The good lab facilities, access to good journals are the issues. May not be the issue for premium institute, but definitely a challenge for the local universities. Yeah. And also, uh, what I feel as a researcher, while I, I used to collect the data from the field, there were issues with the transparency of data also. I mean, I will be talking to the community, to the farmers, to the local bodies. The transparency of data was not there. This is because of the lack of trust. Yeah. So this would be one of the issue. And the most uh, challenge, important challenge that I face, I mean, I feel is the dissemination of knowledge. Yeah. So the uh, scientific findings are always limited to the scientific journals. It is not reaching the public, to the larger good of the public. So that's where, because there, like if it is reaching the actual uh, stakeholder, then only it makes the bigger impact. Otherwise, again, it is always limited to the theses and the papers. Yeah. And one more important point, point what I feel is the researchers today wants to solve uh, very complex and higher end problems uh, more than the real issues. This is something like I, I, my personal experience is for an event. I was people were talking about rockets, all that. I was talking about toilets. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, but basic sanitation is an issue. I think these are the because uh, with this, I feel uh, any researcher taking up research should have a practical exposure, and the need and the problem should come from the field. Yeah, we will not create a problem and then solve the problem. Yeah. So this is one, and then. And what I aspire to see, I aspire to see more and more women in research landscape that will not happen like this. So there should be more inclusiveness. There should be more and more facilities that is required for a woman. I mean, maybe in terms of uh, what is required for a mother researcher. All that, uh, all that facilities should be included in the workplace. And then also having more and more exchange programs with the local universities to the global universities. This is basically to exchange the resources and encouraging interdisciplinary and applied research and linking uh, science and policy. That's how you can actually see the transition from lab to field. Uh, this is one thing we should do. Yeah, in my, when, when, but in particular to my field, what I'm aspiring to see is uh, the regulatory framework that itself we don't have, which will actually benefit the farmer. So something uh, uh, through my research work I would be aspiring to achieve. And then in research in general, the general inclusiveness at uh, workplace, large scale collaborations, and dissemination of the scientific findings are my aspirations to see. Thank you so much for your question. Thank you. Uh, so now I would like to invite the next speaker, Dr. Archini Paruti. She is a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Nanoscience and Engineering. Her curiosity about deep tech led her to explore nanotechnology. She is a trained material science engineer developing biosensor. She has been in one of the 20 nanotechnologists from India for IC Impacts 2016 program. Let's peep into her journey, challenges, and aspirations. A big applause to Dr. Archini. Welcome. Thank you so much, Girija, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm really glad to put up some of my views to this august gathering today, and many congratulations on the opening of this beautiful office at the Infosys Science Foundation. So I'm Archini, and uh, currently I'm working at the Center for Nanoscience and Engineering, Bangalore. Um, to begin, my eternal journey in science actually started way back in 2012 when I was intrigued by these small, tiny nanostructures. I tried to grow it on substrates to make it uh, implant-loving or cell-loving for uh, better orthopedic integration uh, for trauma patients. And then uh, we tried to sandwich it with a couple of uh, hydrophobic drugs. Now, while I was designing these nanobeads, I realized that there is an intense amount of uh, safety issue which come with these nanostructures. Um, so then I started working in the domain of uh, biosafety of oxide nanostructures where I plunged into my PhD. 
And uh, eventually, I ended up finding that there is uh, an electronic structure property correlation when we are seeing an immune response in our body. So now I wanted to take this uh, mechanistic understanding, science-based understanding, into something concrete. And uh, I eventually joined uh, Professor Navakan Bhatt's lab uh, in 2021 to actually develop devices. So I ventured from being a material scientist to a device fabrication person. Uh, and uh, started doing it for renal and cardiac applications. Now, why do we need that is a question. So if you look at the patient overload right now at, at our, in our medical uh, infrastructure, we see that if we take non-communicable diseases, 44% of the load is coming due to uh, cardiovascular diseases. And the rest, uh, 8.2 million that you see over there, all other, is usually the renal ones. So uh, who are at stake? It's, it's basically the younger and the older generation. Younger, of course, because of our unhealthy lifestyle, and older naturally. So if we have glucometers, why can't we have cardiac meters in our houses where we can monitor uh, you know, these vitals? So progression of uh, cholesterol deposition uh, over the period of time. And in the elderly population, those markers that you see are proteins, which are produced 10 to 15 days ahead in time when you have a cardiac arrest. So if you're feeling discomfort and uneasiness, and if you have this at your discretion, you can just test and know right away and rule out such. So we can save a lot of patients at the same time. Um, you know, it kind of helps uh, our medical infrastructure to plan better. So um, the enriching struggle about uh, overall general nano in healthcare is the kind of technical challenges that we face because it's interdisciplinary in nature overall. Then the regulatory bodies and the ethical clearances that we have to go through is a long and a tedious process. Um, every regulatory body has their different directives, and so we have to look into you know, setting the right footing right there. Strong collaboration, so basically ethical clearance in patient sampling, something where doctors and clinicians come at the interface, and we as researchers and scientists should work very, very closely to establish that and help them establish it strongly. Now, uh, we as engineers also need to think about repeatability, reproducibility, and scale since we need to develop a sustainable um, infrastructure for this. Now, as a researcher, again, it's about incentivization. The funds that we get to conduct these kind of complex researches is something that is in need for our country. Then, in general, if you look at the evolution of academia, you know, there's a constant tussle which goes, either you publish or perish, and, you know, all your promotions and incentives are actually based on how much, uh, you know, uh, how strongly are you able to publish in big journals and things like that. And eventually, you know, personal choices like uh, living that American dream and walking that path, uh, having, you know, a relatively comfortable lifestyle eventually, uh, and, you know, family situations in, uh, for everyone are different. So that is something uh, which kind of decides what a researcher is going to do eventually, going to stay in India or abroad. So my dream Indian research ecosystem looks something like this, where uh, we want to do seamless science. It has to be absolutely collaborative and interdisciplinary in nature. We should have an independent research ecosystem when, uh, you know, when we're looking at it, it. It does not require a very constant or static affiliation to institutions rather than being more mobile. And at different stages of life, we can enter in and move out as uh, you know, me, being more inclusive around it. Um, you know, in terms of human resources, it's, it's same size doesn't fit all. So we need uh, different measures for uh, different kinds of people to accommodate. And we need different levels of scientific training and scientific freedom. And we need to have flexible programs for that. Now, if you're talking about, uh, I'm an experimentalist. So 60% of the time, we end up waiting for resources to come into our lab. So why can't we have a flip card, right? So if we can order clothes, then we can get it on a click. Why can't we have chemicals, reagents, and instruments on a click? Um, and eventually, let's talk more about creating a social impact and you know, more about environmental protection in terms of if we are designing a material, if you're doing process flow designs, how much carbon footprint are we generating? So this can be factored in through our regulatory bodies in our country. And with this, I would like to actually thank the Infosys Science Foundation for giving me the opportunity and the platform to put forth my ideas um, in an Institute of Science, Center for Nanoscience and Engineering, National Nanofabrication Center, where we manufacture most of the devices, the Nano Devices and Sensors Lab, Pachod Healthcare, and all the funding agencies who have been generously funding us. So thank you so much.
Thank you all, uh, Archani, Arti, uh, Vinisha, and Girija. We loved hearing your perspectives. It was so refreshing. And uh, now I would actually like to take you to the next uh, session with that. You know, public spaces alongside universities engage a community and people around it in discussions, debates, and dialogues that are important to the fabric of society. So the exploration that they allow is really important. And I think it provides a lot of enrichment of uh, um, arts, community, science, and society. It enables a dialogue between and amongst all of them. And that's really important for our community. So I would like to invite and welcome on stage our three panelists today for this session. Uh, Janvi Falke, who is the founding director of Science Gallery Bangalore. Veera Vichander, the Honorary Director of Bangalore International Center. And of course, Arundhati Ghosh, who is the Executive Director of the India Arts Foundation. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Bhavna, and uh, welcome to this panel. My name is Arundhati. I've been leading India Foundation for the Arts for the past few years. And in my 22 years of working with the foundation, I've had the privilege and the vantage point, actually, to witness and support various kinds of public arts projects, specifically through our Project 560, which, uh, as you can imagine, takes the name from the first three digits of Bangalore's PIN code. India Foundation for the Arts looks at encouraging work in the public domain in the city, which looks at histories of neighborhoods, which looks at our cultural, political, economic journeys that the city has taken. And much of that work actually ends up in public spaces, in the public domain, as public art. So it's been really a great opportunity for me to see how in this city, public spaces that include markets and flyovers and neighborhood parks, uh, community centers, evolve, change, shift over a period of time. And uh, for me, therefore, public spaces have meant like they are the lifeblood of any city. They contribute to the intellectual, political, economic, social interactions in the city. Just by observing public spaces, one could not only understand the character of a city, but also figure out what's happening at the city in the present moment. They contribute to the reputation, the stature of the city, as well as to the well-being of its citizens. But public spaces are also areas where you encounter difference you encounter conflict, debates. One could argue that in any city, the organization of public spaces is perhaps disproportionately influenced by smaller communities, more dominant socioeconomic communities. And therefore, the management and use of public spaces, the role that they will play in a city is determined by them. In Europe, for example, there is a huge challenge of gentrification of public spaces, where, of course, one sees fancy art centers and extremely cool and creative restaurants, cafes come up. But the original inhabitants of those neighborhoods, who could be struggling students, scholars, artists, communities, they have been displaced to the margins of the city. So this panel today will not only discuss how public spaces enable artistic and scholarly scientific temperaments of a city, but also whether that vision includes everybody who calls the city their home. We could not have had a better panel. Today we have with us Ravi, who has been guiding and leading a very important institution in the city, the Bangalore International Center. And we have Janhavi, who has been spearheading the making of the Science Gallery, which is a very significant public space and exists in cities like London, Detroit, 
Dublin, Melbourne. So the first thing that I would like to invite our speakers to share is how do their institutions, these two very important institutions in Bangalore, how do they enable uh, artistic and scientific temperaments, endeavors in the city? And specifically because our host today, the Infosys Science Foundation, um, they prioritize research. Do public spaces like theirs also, could they also evoke, inspire research in these fields? So Ravi, I'll go with you first and then move on to Janavi. Uh, thanks, Arundhati. So before I come to BIC, just some opening comments. First, Bhavna, congratulations. Between the two panels, you have a gender ratio that I know what it feels to be a woman <laughs> STEM researcher in the country. So kudos to you. Uh, the other thing is a data point I'd like to give, which I'm very fond of giving. The 1985 master plan in Bangalore had 25% open spaces. This is a government data. The 2015 master plan, which is shelved, has open spaces at 4%. So 30, 40 years of master plan in the city has led to 25 to 4% and an over-concretization and consequently a shrinking of public spaces. As Arundhati said, Public spaces is where the city comes alive. And it is something that we need if we are to be a vibrant society. We do have serious problems in terms of poverty elevation, healthcare, education, and the like. But there also needs to be a space where public spaces are possible. I've always held the view that we as the elite have a huge responsibility. The erstwhile Maharajas and Maharanis were the ones who were the patrons of such public spaces, arts and culture. We are the Maharajas and the Maharanis of our time. And with that comes great responsibility to do the right thing by our society. Moving on to the Bangalore International Center. Uh, I mean, we've been around since 2005, but we moved to our own premises in 2019. So we call ourselves as a privately enabled, public purpose, inclusive platform for informed conversation, arts and culture. So just let me uh, unbundle that. So when I say privately enabled, this whole place has come with private contribution. And two thirds have come from donors. Three of them are in the room, uh, Nandan Rohini, Mohan Kusum, uh, Shibu Kumari. So donors and members, 1100 members have made such a center possible, which is really the privately enabling feature of it. It is, Inclusive, it's a public purpose in the sense that everything that we do at the BIC, we do something like about 25 events a month. And it, uh, it spans the spectrum of conversation, arts and culture. And all our events are free to attend by anybody. I mean, our dream is even the vegetable vendor must feel comfortable enough to come and consume some music at BIC. I mean, as organized efforts, we have got slum children and the like. But we'd like a day when everybody sees it as their space and comes in. So in, in that sense, it serves a larger public purpose. We are increasingly polarized. So we are looking for safe places where we can have conversation in a reasonable manner without outrage. And we can respect the intelligence of the audience to figure out what resonates with them and what they carry home with them post these kind of sessions. That really is the public purpose of an institution like BIC. In terms of inclusiveness, and I think Arundhati might come back to that later, it is always a struggle because we come from a certain perspective as the elite and the uh, journey that we all have taken. And it requires an extra effort to be able to see what is it that the other needs and also to provision for that. In, and I'll talk about that subsequently. So this is briefly in terms of what this institution does. So in doing such an institution, you need imagination of what it can be. There are objectives and goals that need to be met. Then you need to build such an institution which has aspects about how do you build it on a sustainable basis? How does the building come forth as something that works as a public space? And the third part really is the day-to-day -day operations. Because many people who do public spaces, they tend to focus on raising money to do the building. But if it is not sustainable on a year-to-year -year basis, all your best of intentions will come to naught. So those are the kind of day-to-day -day challenges in running an institution like BIC. 
And you know, it's sad that in a city like Bang, I mean, if you really take the last 15, 20 years, Rang Shankara, Jagriti, you can't even name enough spaces that have come alive. BIC, of course, has the new building came in 2019. This year end, we'll have the Science Gallery, Bangalore, and uh, also the Museum of Art and Photography uh, that is going to hit the city. We need hundreds of them. And which brings me to my last point. The way forward in this space is considerable collaboration. We need to collaborate across institutions, across various bodies, uh, NGOs, civil society, creative people, because it's only through collaboration, enabled through these kind of public spaces, can the true intent of public spaces making a city come alive, come true. And at BIC, for instance, almost 40% of our programming is through collaboration. We collaborate with the Science Gallery, we collaborate with IFA, we collaborate with NIMANS, a whole range of institutions. And currently, we are in conversation with about 8 to 10 scientific institutions in Bangalore. Uh, and there is a plan to do a Science in the City exhibition uh, uh, facilitated by the Nilakani Philanthropies uh, so that we could actually bring science out there to a curious audience. Because what we have developed over time is a generally interested, curious audience. And if we can expose them more and more to the need for fundamental research, to what science can do, some magic could happen as a result of that. Thanks, Ravi. Thanks, Ravi. And here I want to specifically mention, because you mentioned collaboration, uh, what indeed was a pleasure to work with the metro stations in uh, Bangalore. Many of them have opened themselves out to be public spaces, IFA and other organizations, cultural organizations I know have worked with them and you know it's beautiful to create these spaces together with public-private partnerships as well because as we know many of the best places in a city are owned by uh, by the government so if there are ways and means with which we can work with municipalities or uh, like the metro um, spaces it would be great to bring those spaces alive so private entities could not just provide space but also provide content and the programming for some of the spaces that I see are lying without any uh, sort of life in them. So we could also help build life into these spaces. So with that, Janavi, you have been, you've taken on this huge challenge coming from academia to actually create a space from scratch in this city. Tell us a little bit about your journey with it. Thank you. You want this mic? Yeah. Might be Might better, be actually. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. So before I start to speak a little bit about what, you know, why is it, why this, a space like Science Gallery Bengaluru is necessary and what it might do, I must say in the first instance that the Science Gallery was established with massive support from the government of Karnataka. And whenever I share this bit of information with people across India, but also abroad, the surprise is actually visible. So, you know, that, that, uh, that a state government decided to pour significant amounts of money and then now, which is uh, followed by both incredible amounts of time and funding from other sources as well. And again, uh, as luck would have it, but also not quite luck because, you know, we keep hearing this all the time, the supporters for public spaces, the supporters for research and the supporters for the kind of enterprise this building is engaged in is again um, credited back to, to the same people. And, uh, you know, two of our board members, uh, Rohini Nilekani and Chris Gopal Krishnan, are in this room. And I'm, I'm delighted uh, that, you know, I'm, I'm able to speak about this institution in front of, uh, front of them as well. So why Science Gallery Bengaluru? So if I were to give the one sentence definition of it, it is a public space, a public institution for research-based engagement. Why do we need it? So as I like to say, and some of you might have heard me say this earlier, we have a very strong professional conversation around science in India. We do not have a cultural conversation about science or engineering in India to the same extent, in fact, if you allow me to provoke, none at all. So we talk about science, engineering, medicine, etc. in terms of rankings, examinations, institutions, competition, as our younger colleagues reminded us today. These are the conversations you might actually have on a across it. Now, of course, there are always exceptions. So please don't come and tell me later. Actually, at our dinner table, we do talk about projects. But where averages go, where a generalization can actually work at that level, the conversation at the dinner table is about JE ranks. It's about getting what kind of a package are you getting? Where are you getting admitted to? Where's your postdoc? Are you in an Ivy League? 
etc 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 it's not about so what's your project why are you doing it why does it matter who have you spoken to how how is it relevant to any of us around we do not have that kind of conversation why does a conversation of that kind matter so if we zoom out and think about the kind of challenges that we face and some of us will not be there when the challenges come to fruition in the most horrible ways but our younger colleagues will be there climate change new technologies data surveillance these are the kinds of problems that are asking us to reimagine our relationship to nature but i would argue also about our relationship to fundamental knowledge and to research so where is that conversation going to happen and so science gallery bengaluru i would propose is an is an institution is a space where such a reimagination re of our relationship to nature but also our relationship to fundamental knowledge could happen by by bringing together people from across the disciplines and what i mean here is the human the social and the natural sciences awards that the infosys science foundation actually already awards so conversations between these people but also in the presence and sometimes under the eye of the public so we have at the science gallery a public engagement complex with exhibition galleries etc but also a public laboratory complex because what science gallery should serve is an as an ideas incubator a place where new questions that we want to ask new fundamental questions that we want to ask given the fundamental crises or the grand crises that that you know um, uh, mr murthy spoke about earlier if those are the questions we need to ask then this is the place to arrive at those questions which can then be taken up in more specialized places for prototyping for inquiry in practices across knowledge making across knowledge production in the various branches of science uh, the human social and natural if i may say so again but also art and so practices come in there you know disciplines have a very very recent history you know and and my my training and my inspiration both come from history of science i'm a historian of science by training disciplinary history has a history of a, you know disciplinary uh, history of disciplines has a very recent history it's about 150 odd years old before that we had natural philosophy moral philosophy and if, and the more you go into the deeper past you find that actually the conversations across artistic and knowledge making practices was was not seen as separate the contradictions were not presented the contradictions are of our making or or the or the making of our age in a sense right and so this is this is you know this is this is what i'm hoping this space will become now let me let me just say a couple of words about where my inspiration comes from and i said my my training is in the history of science chandrashekhar venkataraman this country's only nobel laureate who was you know who who was born here who was raised here who studied here who worked here who died here he for the first 10 years of his professional life and some of you have again heard me say this before for the first 10 years of his professional life was an accountant by day and he carried out his research in a public laboratory in the evening the indian association for cultivation of science in calcutta it is that lab that allowed him to pursue his passion in a manner in which the i mean the results of which you know are for us to see and the rest as they say is history where is that kind of space today where if you are not clearing those hurdles those examinations that our younger colleagues spoke about and entering an institution with constraints you're working in a lab you have to get a degree you have to get this you have to get that etc where is that space for that passion to flourish where is that space for a physicist to talk to a historian or a biologist to talk to a sociologist mm. that is the kind of space science gallery bengaluru should become a space for dialogue a space for conversation but not conversation that stops at that a conversation that that actually nurtures a collaboration in order to ask as our as our colleagues spoke about as our younger colleagues spoke about ask questions of here what are the questions that we wish to ask what not in the service of an agenda that has already been set elsewhere but what are the questions that are worthy of asking what are the questions that are worthy of solving here with the help of our colleagues our publics and our scholars so that in brief is the kind of space that you know we are we are we are trying to create and i am 
um, you know, I'm grateful for the kind of support the city offers. I mean, I myself come from Bombay, but I, I, after four and a half years of being in this city and not having experienced much of it because my nose is to the ground, uh, what I can say is that a gallery of this kind could not have been done anywhere else in India but in Bangalore. Just as at the turn of the 19th century, Calcutta was India's science city, today, without a doubt, it is Bangalore. And so a place like this can, can nurture and grow in, in this city. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm actually delighted that we have the kind of support we have from the government, from industry and philanthropy, but also from academia. We work with the Indian Institute of Science and the National Center for Biological Sciences and Shushri Institute of Design as our academic partners. But of course, that you know, we, we've been working equally well with the International Center for Theoretical Sciences, the Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research, so on and so forth, uh, not just in Bangalore, but also across India. So because Science Gallery Bengaluru is the only Asian gallery, our mandate is in a way national. Uh, the Asian scene might change, uh, uh, you know, in the future, but but we remain the only uh, gallery in India, and therefore our ambitions, in a sense, have also to scale and address, in a sense, challenges that uh, exceed the city. But the, you know, at the end of the day, all practices, all presence are local, right? You 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 grow in your context, your context nurtures you, and in that sense, I think what we have is the opportunity to create a model that not only speak to the rest of in, speaks to the rest of india but also to the rest of the world it is an audacity perhaps or an ambition that my team and i nurture that we want to grow a different kind of public space for science here that will inform how public spaces for science across the world might begin to function in a few years thanks so much janavi for that very detailed um, vision and uh, way forward for the science gallery. Now, something that's come up today many times in through different ways uh, from the talks preceding us by the four scholars as well as from what uh, Ravi and Janavi you shared is a sense of multiplicity, a sense of inclusion. How do we ensure and um, I'll go back to a little story. You know, many years ago, I was doing a session about um, IFA at the Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore. And a young student in the room asked me something. We were talking about inclusion and how do we hear all the voices that we must hear. And she said, but you know, I'm in a room. How do I know who's not in the room? It was a question that I stumbled on. And I asked myself, yes, when we are in a room and... Um, Ravi mentioned our own privileged positions in his talk. So if you are in that place, how do you know who's not in the room? Even as I sit here, I look around, our younger colleagues have talked about the gender discrimination. We've talked about how science, Janavi, you pointed to how science needs to talk to other disciplines and other uh, practitioners. How do we make sure that we are truly exclusive? Because Public spaces, just like our public, come from various kinds of identities, beliefs, political positions. Uh, how do we? So they are also spaces where we not only meet in harmony, but we also meet in confrontation. We meet through encounters. And how do we make those encounters constructive to asking the questions that we really need to ask and to finding those solutions together? Could public spaces become those kind of inclusive spaces that allows for safe and nurturing ways to debate our differences. Can they perform that function as well? From intellectual programming that Janavi you spoke about to very practical things like um, uh, an artist friend of mine who also happens to be a transgender woman was once not allowed into a space where she was going to perform that evening. So it was the irony of the place that people had come there to watch her work. And she was standing outside the gate having her everyday fight with the, uh, with the person who would be letting her in. To another note, a survey of public spaces around this uh, city will show us how many of them have a very simple thing like a wheelchair ramp. So when we are talking about accessibility, and use of public space, not just in programming, but also in just sheer participation. Who can access, who determines who can access these spaces, and who's threatened by the presence of whom and why. Our 
important questions that impact the relationship we have with public spaces. Uh, so, I, and I know as leaders, and because you know we we keep talking, I know the huge challenges that and negotiations that Ravi and Janavi has to do on an everyday basis now, as well as Janavi once your. Um, uh, science gallery is actually launched. What kind of policies, frameworks, thoughts, people do we need to include in our institutions to ensure this kind of inclusivity? The inclusivity that makes these spaces. Uh, Ravi, you said, you know, like, I, I wish that the vegetable vendor also comes in. But starting from the way our institutions look to how they behave, how they feel, how do we make them welcoming for everybody who calls the city their home. Is it possible to do that? It's possible. See, one thing is, inclusivity is not a coat that you can put on. Like, today I will be inclusive, or in this session I will be inclusive. It's got to be in the institutional DNA. I mean, it has to be a way of life. And only that will work. Otherwise, I mean, uh, you know, it, it will be quite uh, apparent that this is just tokenism. So I think the most important thing really is, the board and the operating people need to embrace that and be a part of the DNA. That's the basic thing. Uh -huh. Because of the leadership, if you don't have that, uh -huh. it's not going to flow down. Then comes the issues in terms of, there are many of these issues. Let's take LGBTQ and issues of that kind. Some of the marginalized or sensitive about wheelchair access or hearing impaired. You need to be willing to listen and you need to be willing to partner with people who have thought about these issues. Uh -huh and have addressed them. It again goes back to a different kind of collaboration. Yeah. Collaborating with people who have been there, done that, and you bring them on board mm -hmm. because they know more than you do. Mm -hmm. And I, therefore it requires a certain humility and you got to avoid any hubris that you know it all and you know what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Another challenge for instance is even in the polarized world, to find that balance between right, left, middle, it's a yeah. daily challenge. Mm -hmm. And somebody is mm -hmm. taking umbrage or outrage day after day. So you got to work at it. To my mind, there is no easy answer. There is sensitivity training as far as the example you gave to the security, housekeeping, etc. That is also an important part beyond just the posh training. And since we are at the Infosys Science Foundation, I would think that uh, fundamental research science is as marginalized as some of the other sections. And places like BIC need to figure a way to mainstream the discussion about what we need to do about science as a society. So I would even include science as an endangered species in the larger populace. <laughs> so it's when you talk about inclusiveness, it's across the board yeah. and not necessarily yeah. the conventional the set of people that we yeah. tend to yeah. see. Thank you. And, and as, a, as a historian, I can tell you I'm an endangered species on the Indian Institute of Science campus. So uh, I think I, I, it's context, right? It's context. What, what's on the margins and what needs to be in conversation with what? So, um, so you know, like Ravi mentioned, We've been acutely aware of ensuring the basics that we can do. There are things that you control and then there are things that are larger and cultural and invite debate and conversation, which happen only in due course. But the building, you know, um, ramp access, um, other accessibility measures, uh, bathrooms, et cetera, et cetera, all of that has been taken care of in the building and, you know, likewise at, at, the, at the BIC as well. But here are a few things that we are trying to do. And the last point speaks to, in fact, what, what Ravi just said. So the first thing we do is all our public engagement programming. The content for the public programming that we create ourselves is offered in both Kannada and English. So that's the first thing we do because that's in our hands, right? And, and uh, with in due course, with you know expansion of our activities, we will probably be able to expand into other Indian languages as well. But right now we do English and Kannada. The second thing, the metro programs that you spoke about. We've also conducted met, uh, programs at the metro stations uh, before the pandemic. We hope to get back to that, um, you know, uh, um, in due course. Again, we are, in fact, we have our very first physical event after the pandemic on Saturday. Um, but the third thing is partnerships, right? Because as an institution, you cannot be reinventing the debate yeah. all the time. And in a sense, you you have to participate. You have to. Um, supplement, you have to extend, you have to exceed this, these kinds of debates. And therefore, what we are trying to do, given that science is also exclusionary. I mean, our young co colleagues, you know, spoke about it in, in terms of gender, in terms of, you know, uh, other, other fault lines along which science is, is not, uh, or knowledge making, right? In, 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 and research is not accessible to uh, everyday life or to the public. 
And there, I think partnerships play a huge role. Institutions that are already working with what we think are constituencies where this message needs to, to, to reach are organizations and institutions that we need to work with very closely in order to provide the content, listen, revise the content, revive the interest. And so in many ways, when someone asks me, and this is, a, this is a question that's almost always asked of any new institution, so how are you going to scale up eventually, right? And I think the answer that I have is that replicability for us is scalability. It's not about putting 5,000 people instead of 1,000 people in one room. That's not the right kind of scaling. Yeah. Because otherwise, as I used to earlier, and you know, I, I, my sense of humor uh, you know, has, has since dampened. But in my very first year, I used to say, I would like to not encourage the darshan mode of going to see a science, uh, you know, kind of festival or a, or a, or a research festival or a exhibition, um, but ask for deeper engagement and time, right? And if, if, you, if you want to do that, then these kinds of partnerships become uh, quite essential going forward. Thanks, yeah. So shall we open this out for uh, a couple of, maybe we can take Bhavna about a couple of questions? Yeah, okay, from from the audience, if we have for, yeah. And if you could, uh, sir, tell us uh, who the question is for. Hello, yeah, yeah. check. Uh, yeah, anyone in the panel can take this. So, in fact, basically my question is what Mr. Ravi touched upon, you know, how public play, uh, spaces are seen as this elite class, you know, where uh, not many people from marginalized section participate. So, my question is even to, you know, to understand how we can make it more participative and inclusive to the marginalized uh, uh, set of audience, especially students from government colleges who really lack those uh, scientific facilities. So how can it be made uh, inclusive for them? So one way is really outreach. I think you have to go where the audiences are. If they are not able to come initially, you need to go and do it in those schools. Or if there's an exhibition, you try and bust some of these people and expose them to this. So I think it requires huge effort. You can't just say, I'm doing this, now it's your responsibility to land up here. I think the institution's responsibility extends to outreach and for it to basically gain steam over a period of time, the problem will self-solve itself once more people know what this is about. But initially, I feel the way out is to go where the audiences are. So you sometimes if you have a program, be prepared to do it in two, three other places closer to the communities that you want to reach to is a one way to look at it. There's another question at the back. Yeah. Thank you, uh, panel. My name is Rishi, um, and that was a very, very engaging discussion. So I, I thank all of you. Couple of observations which I would just like to put forth, and if you have any sort of uh, answers to that, one is Arundhati, your point on 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 art. If you today travel around uh, Bangalore and go towards Indira Nagar, 80 feet road. Recently, you'll see a lot of graffiti on the wall with historical figures uh, with QR codes to identify and get the history about them. A very engaging concept, I thought. But in this panel, if you're talking about inclusivity and collaboration, I also think of uh, the little children on that road probably begging for arms or urchins who do not have access to any kind of smartphones or would not even know who these figures are or QR codes. In that sense, how do we make this more collaborative because it's a fantastic initiative. I mean, it's very easy to criticize these things, but it's a fantastic initiative. But how do we make it more inclusive? And Ravi, even um, I'm a very, um, I'm a regular at, at BIC. So congrats on the great work that BIC is doing. Um, and to your point on, you know, having these centers being very exclusive, opening them for everybody uh, who would like to visit from vegetable vendors to anyone to call it a space of their own. Now, um, Across the country, there are sub collaborative spaces like this, even if you look at Habitat Center in Delhi and so on and so forth. If I were to have um, somebody come into these centers who's probably from particular strata of society, I personally feel they still feel a little intimidated because if they were to attend a program or even say buy a, a plate of food there, it's still not very affordable. So in that sense of the term, how do we make these spaces more collaborative or inclusive? 
very general observation. Thank you. So just to, Rishi, quickly to respond to the first part of your uh, question, very interesting observation. I would actually go a step forward and say, whose pictures do you put on the walls of a city? Um, the Aravani Art Collective has done an amazing job of putting uh, the people who mattered the most during the pandemic on the walls of the city, which included our paramedical staff, which included policemen, which included uh, the parakarmikas who take care of our sanitation. Uh, so who do you consider heroes? So for people who are looking at these images, the moment I see me in them or my community in them, it's a different kind of connection that we make with the city. So while, yes, historical figures, again, question of whose history, historical figures are important, I would say that that is in the programming of these walls also. Let us have people we can, all our communities can identify with. So not just how we know who they are, but also who are they actually? Quick answer. I mean, it's true. I mean, you know, it's the mall. It's what's called the mall effect. The people who work at the mall can't shop at the mall. Yeah, you're extending it to saying that the people who come to the place also can't buy the things at the place. The, this is a big challenge. You know, we actually try to look at the 30, 40 rupee coffee. But every provider said, can you promise me 2,000, 3,000 cups per day? And I can't. So this is the chicken and the egg problem. I think one way out around it is to actually allow, the, for example, the person who on his cycle brings coffee and tea for our staff. All of us have that. We can ask him to hang around and also make that available to the rest. So we need food carts. Outside. Yeah, food carts are there. So we could extend that to make that cheaper alternative. So we need to think creatively about some of these things. Because when the volumes are low, invariably the people who operate uh, have a higher price point. That's economics. Yeah, I mean... It's a difficult question, right? Because what we are asking for is the resolution of what is a massive problem in the microcosm of what are relatively smaller institutions, right? Like, and of course, I mean, that's not to say that we don't address those problems. Like I said, you know, we do what, what we can do. We also have other uh, programs. And, and I think I would like to underscore what Arundhati just said, which is the content of your programming is indicative of whether it's inclusive of no, or not, right? It's not about taking the histories off or the content of um, things that don't speak to your audiences. So how do you make science every day, right? And so we have a, we have a series of programs that we hope to you know, uh, begin once the building is open, which are called Science with Society, as opposed to Science and or for or, you know, uh, and so how, how, how do you conduct that? So I think the content is critical, but also I think we have to be acutely aware that, you know, this is a much larger problem that we need to resolve at various points and various phases of our lives, right? So how do people pay their domestic staff, for example? How do people treat the accountants in their office, for example? So I think there are so many points in our day-to-day -day lives that this problem can be addressed with integrity and honesty and some degree of, you know, uh, commitment. Uh, and, and we, I mean, you know, as, as public institutions, we also should be held uh, responsible and, you know, pulled up when we don't do that. But I think this is a, this is a, the, the problem of social transformation is such a large one in India and I think we are all going to, and that's the bottleneck, and that literally is the bottleneck also for kinds of things we're talking about. Those things that I spoke about, the questions from India, right? Like what are the questions we are trying to answer? What are the questions worthy of answering here, right? It's, it's you know, our imaginations are shrunk by the lack of social transformation, right? And I think that, you know, that needs much bigger work and all of us are at it, but I think uh, we'll need to do much more, much, much more. Yes, so thank you very much for this. I'd like to end with saying, you know, I read somewhere that the most developed countries are not those where poor people have fancy cars, but where rich people take public transport. And I think we could uh, say that about public spaces as well. The most developed place cities are not where you have tons of posh, exclusive, fancy, arty places but where our public spaces are alive and thriving with the life that that city is. Thank you so much for patiently listening to us. Thank you all. I'm going to steal a line from Visa. Uh, they said, when more of us play, all of us win. And I think that's what we hope will happen here in our city. 
with many public spaces. Thank you all for that very, very uh, open dialogue, very 